I think that if you learn how to love the process, learn how to love the process, like fall in love with doing the work in a good way, not in the ego way, but in a way like learn to enjoy the work. Don't just look at the outcomes. Number one, because you spend most of your life doing the work and it's only a small percentage of your life where you get to celebrate the outcome, right? And you obviously you want the outcome. My theory is if you love what you do, you will naturally do a better job at it without having to think about it, right? You just naturally do better because you love it. And if you do better, you're going to have, if you want to call it a product, you're going to have a better product and people are going to like it more and they're going to buy it more, right? And then at the end of the day, if you don't have the big outcome that you want, you still did something you loved and that in itself is a win. I think the really cool part about this is um, having somebody that I've known this long on the show has been really uh, something that I'm really looking forward to. So yeah. John Mark, welcome to the Entrepreneur Studio. Well, thank you. The John Mark McMillan. Yes. Well, it's an honor. Some of our audience knows that you're a platinum award-winning songwriter and a successful entrepreneur to boot. Um, but like one of the things that I was thinking about what the type of conversation that I wanted to have with you is like artists and entrepreneurs have got a lot in common. One of the biggest things is making meaningful connections, mm -hmm. you know, like one, you know, with audiences or customers, right. And creating, creating meaning really seems to be kind of like the juice or like the engine behind your songwriting. So tell us, you know, tell us a little bit about how meaning making impacts your work as a songwriter. Yeah, totally. So these days, people talk a lot about value, about giving people value, mm -hmm. especially on uh, social media where you're not talking about dollars and cents. You're talking about creating value. And it was it's hard for me sometimes. First of all, I don't think value is a bad term, but as a, as a songwriter, it's like, what type of value am I really bringing to people? Mm -hmm. I'm not really an entertainer, you know? And there's a lot of artists who are great entertainers. I think what I do can be entertaining. So... For me, it, it's helpful to think of what I do is offer people meaning, yeah. right? And so I've been thinking a lot about just the whole idea of meaning. And I sort of, as I look back, I realize like in a lot of ways, meaning is the um, is my like primary asset, right? Mm -hmm. It's what I have to give people. And, and any time that I try and I try to create something in order to have an impact. I have less of an impact than when I create something with meaning and then look for an opportunity to see that thing go. And so I've sort of decided over the years that the engine that drives everything that I do, my business, my art, even I even look at it as kind of a ministry too, because I feel like I'm serving people and in, in, on those different fronts, right? Mm -hmm. um, when I look at the engine that drives it all, it's really meaning that drives it. And I think that... I think when you talk about meaning, what we're really talking about is like the why question. Mm -hmm. I was thinking a lot about this interview because I haven't done a lot of business podcasts before. Yeah, I'm a yeah. business person. I make a living. I own my own tiny little record company. Mm -hmm. It just has me and my wife on it. Maybe someday I'll have some other people on it. But, you know, so I am a business person. Yeah. Um, but I was, I was thinking, what do I have to offer like the business community or the entrepreneurial community? And I think that, um, or what I what <laughs> what came to mind is this idea that um, that this why question could be the driving factor for everything that you do. Mm. And there's a lot of ways to make a living. There's a lot of there's a lot of ways to have a business. There's a lot of ways to make money. There's a lot of good ways to make money. There's probably some lesser good ways to make yeah. money. For me, though, the best way to make a living is to do something meaningful because I, I tend to think, I, I had a friend one time who said, I'll spend all day, if I got to chop a tree down, I'm gonna spend all day sharpening the ax, I'm gonna spend five minutes chopping the tree down. And it feels like for me, when I'm doing something that doesn't have, doesn't flow from that meaningful place, mm -hmm. I feel like I spend a lot of time trying to chop that tree down, right? I spend a lot of time trying to get people to pay attention to my music or to buy tickets to my shows or um, whatever it is that I'm trying to do to, 
you know, support my family or grow my business. But when I make something with meaning, I still have to do those other things. But it's just a sharper ax. Just it just moves so much better. Mm -hmm. It it has such a greater impact when it comes from that meaningful place. Then when I'm trying to like, it's almost like I put a lot of work on the front end into creating something meaningful, and then it just kind of goes. Yeah. And you still got to do work to make it go. It doesn't just go on its own. But it's so much smoother. It works out so much better when I come from that place. And there are times in my career, because I've been doing this for over 20 years now, there are moments when things were really hard. When it's like things weren't working. And when I look back, one of the commonalities during those seasons was that I had gotten beyond myself and I was trying to make things happen from the business side without having that meaningful thing there to drive it. And, wow. and things always seemed to turn around when I stopped and I went back and made the art the first thing. When I when I dug into the art, instead of trying to find the audience for the art, it's like I'd stopped and started making stuff again that mattered. And then it became easier to find an audience when mm -hmm. I was doing something that mattered than to take something that may just be a good thing and try and force it on an audience. Yeah. Right? Does, does that make sense? It makes a lot of yeah. sense. And there's this, you know, there's a, there's a, I'd say a, a fine balance, right? Because, uh, you know, if you think about it, what, what got you beyond yourself and got away from the meaning was probably, and I think you should talk about this, the, there's a, probably a little bit of pressure to continue to perform in order to have sort of your, um, progress to continue or your means, your, your needs to be met and things like that. What were, what, 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 what created that distance between, you know, moving away from the meaning and needing to actually get in front of an audience or do the, do the thing to perform in order to do what? Like, what was the thing that you were, that you saw yourself moving towards that moved you away from the meaning making? Sure. I, at different times it's been different things. And I mean, it's a, it's a little bit of a battle every day. It's like, um, you know, maybe, um, early on we started to realize with touring, when an album comes out, that first year is good. And sometimes the team will be like, that year was great. Let's go out and do it again. Right. And we go out and the next year, it's like the numbers are down and it's like, wow, that's hard. That's always hard, you know, because you, you're doing one thing and you think, oh, next year is going to be even better than this year. But I should, there's so many times I should have just stopped mm. and made the new record and put the time in to make the new record instead of trying to make more out of the season I was currently in or maybe the season that was currently over, mm -hmm. right? So that's one thing. I think the other thing is when I first, because I knew like nothing about this stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing about music business is I guess there are music business courses and things now, but I didn't go to one. Yeah. I don't even know that there were many of those types of things available, which honestly, a lot of that stuff wouldn't help me much now because everything's changed so much in the yeah. past 20 years. But um, but I, I kind of had to figure it out on my own. So when things first started to go, I was like, oh, it's only up and to the right. Mm -hmm. Like it's only the trajectory is only good. And you sort of start to take some things for granted, right? You take your audience for granted. You take that relationship for granted. You, the other people who are with you, sometimes you take them for granted, not on purpose and not even necessarily from an ego standpoint, though that comes into play sometimes too. Yeah. But it's more so from the fact that you just start getting busy and you're like, people actually like me. I, human beings are buying tickets to see me and hear my songs. Mm -hmm. Like some of my songs are on the radio, like, this is happening. And you just get so busy, you get tied up in the that side of it, right? Where you're like, you know, where, where I think things shift a little bit. I, I feel like I need to spend like 80% of my time focused on the meaning making. Yeah. And the 20% of the time figuring out how to monetize the meaning or create opportunities for the meaning to, uh, well, I've obviously got to figure out how to live a sustainable life. Yeah, right, for sure. And so, you know, creating those opportunities. But I think there is, it's very tempting sometimes when things are going really, really well to, sw to switch that out and, you know, maybe start spending 80% of my time on the more business related things. Mm -hmm. It's, I guess it's not really business versus art because both parts are part of the business, right? Yeah. And I guess that's the point. But start on the monetization stuff, trying to figure out new ways to make money, start to figure out how to get more out of each thing. None of that is bad. But I've realized when things shift to where I'm spending 80% of my time doing that, 
I actually do worse. I do a lot more work and I don't get the uh, return. Then when it sort of switched around and it's like 80% of my time is spent on making meaning and connections and community. And it's been 20% of my time figuring out how to, you know, make a living off of it. That, see that that right there though requires, <clears throat> I'd say a pretty significant amount of self-awareness, situational awareness. Um, and like sometimes that, y you know, uh, I think business owners, entrepreneurs struggle with something similar, which is how, you know, there's, there's some why that made their thing great at some point. Yeah. And what you're talking about is the thing that made and makes your stuff great is the meaning making and you know how to do that. And that is a big part of your art, Yeah. right? Um, it isn't the delivery of the art only through music. Yeah, yeah. You, there's something else that's going on, right? And so one of the things that I think would be good to talk about is talk about maybe a moment where you had the aha of like, I'm spending 80% 80, 80 of my time. What was the situation that you were in that was like your biggest aha moment of like, I, I need to go back to the meaning making? Totally. Well, and I think this is where some of this language began for me because I was doing it before, but I didn't know. You know, I, I didn't know. I, I, I wouldn't have been able to articulate it the way I do yeah. now. But I had, there are definitely, definitely times looking back in the past 20 years where like things were not going good. And not going good meaning, you know, um, there's less interest in what I'm doing. And the thing about being an artist, and this is true for like everyone. Do you think of like the Rolling Stones or Prince or um, Beyonce or, you know, Taylor Swift? You think of them as only going up, but there are waves. And and the super huge artists, they their waves roll an upward trajectory. Yeah, but no one is there forever, right? And so I think when um, when you're young, when you're in your twenties, and you like have five good years, you're like, this is it. This is not going to stop. Mm -hmm. And then you maybe plateau for a while, or maybe even like have a a regression. A, yeah, exactly. You're like, why is this happening? Like, what am I doing differently? And then there was a point probably about five years ago, maybe a year or two before the pandemic, and things just weren't working very well. And um, it, it can be for any number of reasons. I mean, the music industry is in constant change, mm -hmm. constant change. And there are these big changes that happen every mm, 10 years, or at least have, you know, yeah. as long as I've been in it, right? We could talk about that if you wanted to, but there are these big changes, but there are little changes too where things you used to do don't work anymore. And so um, I got, I reached a point where things were not working very well. Mm -hmm. I was not, I was having a hard time doing the things that I'd previously done before. Yeah. And there's this real interesting thing in music industry when, because no one can really say what good and bad music is. You can say what awful music is. Then there's moments where like, there's something about that that's incredible. But for the most part, you can't really say what good and bad music is. Yeah. And even some of, you know, uh, there's, you know, if you watch any type of, um, um, you know, movie about, what, what, what do they call that? The biopic? Or, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, um, they all have the same thing where everyone's like, that'll never work. That's not going to work. That's never going to work. Yep. You know, like, um, and then, of course, it does. And that's the movie, right? Yep. It does. And so no one really knows. No one really knows what is good and bad. Um, so everything is sort of a perception. So if you seem like you're on an upwards trajectory, it's easy to get people around you. It's easy to get people um, interested in what you're doing from an industry perspective. Mm -hmm. But if you seem like you're going in the other direction, <laughs> it's hard to get anybody to pick up the phone. Yeah, This is not like real estate. You're like, that's obviously worth this much because it, this is where it is and this is what's around it. Yeah. But I'll make us, I'll write a song and, and there's no way for anyone to know that it's good unless the one before it did good. And they're like, well, that one will probably do good. So you, you get in that type of situation. So there are those ups and downs, right? And I was in one of those really difficult sort of like low moments. Yeah. And I was like, what, what am I doing? And I was like, what, what am I actually doing? And I realized, in that moment, I've never really articulated why it is I do what I do. I think I knew it deep down at different moments. Mm -hmm. And at different times, it was probably different. But I'd never really been able to articulate. And I decided I want to articulate why it is that I do what I do. And I realized, especially with the way 
um, the music industry, and honestly, the way probably most industries work now, you're not just doing one thing. You're doing like five things. Yeah. Even if you have a restaurant, you're still doing social media, right? If you're doing, um, I don't know, if you're whatever you're selling. I mean, my brother-in-law uh, runs a farm and he has a social media team, yep. you know? Um, and so it's like, you're, you're doing multiple things, right? And I realized that when you don't know or you can't articulate why it is you do what you do, it's really difficult to get all those things to work together. Mm -hmm. Or it can be very difficult. But when you know or have a general idea or are able to articulate why you're doing what you're doing, you're like, well, we can do this or this with social media, but this is what we're doing. So when we're not sure what to do, let's do that. Let's talk about that. And we can get off and, and go over here and we can talk about this and we can do that. There's all kinds of things we can do. But if I ever have to choose or if I ever don't know what to do, it's like, well, this is what we're doing. So how do we do that? Mm -hmm. So then you move from the why to the how. But the how is very hard at times yeah. if you don't know what the why is. Um, but I'm, I'm convinced that that can be very helpful in any business. Because if you know what the why is, not just the why for you, the why can't just be making money and it's good to make money. Every, everyone needs to make a living. Yeah. It's, it's nice to you know do all the stuff. I like money too. I don't dislike money, right? But I don't think that for most people, not for everyone, but I don't think for most people, money alone is enough incentive to carry you through the long term. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's nice to make money. Now, if you're not making money, that, that everything will stop. It's a demotivator. It's a sure. demotivator for sure. But for me, I feel like most people need to be able to know what they're doing. If, if you're making money, for it's because you're making somebody's life better. Somewhere, yeah. Right? Generally, I can't think of too many ways to make money where you're not at least trying to make someone's life better. At least they think you're making their life better, right? Yeah. So, like, what is the why? Like, whatever it is you do, you're obviously serving somebody, right? And, and even things that seem sort of mundane and normal are really not when you when you think about it because you're touching human lives you're helping humans live you're helping humans pursue their dreams you know if you serve a restaurant or even a chain of restaurants like there's restaurant owners there are people who dreamed about that restaurant and you're you're touching their lives and you are part of their dream right yep. and if you can dream for them you're so much better at what you do just by being able to do that because if you're dreaming for them, you know what they need. Yeah. Maybe even more than they know what they need. But also they feel that from you. You know, whatever it is that you do, if you if you can dream for the people that you're serving, yep. you I'm convinced you can do a better job than as if you're just doing it, you know, for money. Yep. And that sounds kind of bad because there's nothing wrong with making money. But I just think in my world, and I know people who exemplify the opposite of what I'm saying. So I realize that like, it's not, this isn't like a prescription. Yeah, yeah. But for me, I feel like I actually do better in business when I serve the people better. Yeah. Or I should say all the things I need to do in business are easier and they work better when I'm serving people better. Yeah, you're operating from the why. Yeah, yeah I'm that's operating really from good. the why. Well, that's a big part of your brand too. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've built a brand um, you have, uh, I'd say honesty and authenticity is what people expect from you. Um, whether you've, you know, with your discography, right? Like you've got a whole range of things you've experienced that you have been willing to be vulnerable and share. And that has become really a big part of your brand. And I, I think something I heard you talk about, uh, the other day, which I thought was really good was a part of the way that you're serving and a part of the thing that creates this meaningful connection uh, is giving other people a voice and you're saying something that they've been trying to say or that they've wanted to say that maybe that, that they've not been able to. And there's an expression that can come from that. And that is sort of a source of sharing. Yeah. So I, I think, I think that's one of the things that would be great for you to kind of talk about a little bit is how you give people a voice, right? Yep. And that's a part of your service. Yep to the to the, the your community absolutely well i realized something not long ago when d even just looking at like my social media numbers like um why did this video do really well and this video did not do really well right and if there are similar formats and there's not much different as far as the way they were done there's all those little things 
that if you do wrong, the algorithm isn't going to treat you very well. Yeah. But if you kind of know how it works, you're like, why did this one do well and this didn't do well? Yeah. And I realized something. People don't share your content because they think you're cool, mostly. Sometimes you see someone like playing a guitar and they're just wailing. You're like, that's just cool. Yeah. I'm going to share it. Most of the time, they don't do that. Most of the time, people share things because they deep down want to share themselves. And, and so when someone sings a song that feels like you or resonates with you, when there's a lyric or even some of my videos where I'm just talking, I realize people are not sharing it because they're like, oh, John Mark's smart. People are sharing it because what they're saying is like, I feel this way too. This is me, right? And so what happens is you sort of become a voice for them when I talk about meaning or whatever and someone shares that video. What they're really saying is like, this is how I feel. So what they're really doing is sharing themselves. And the cool thing is that when you realize that, um, the videos that like um, 15,000 people share do better than videos that people just look at. Yep. Right? It also, it's it's great um, for, for connection and connecting with new people and growing your brand because literally other people are sharing you. But they're not sharing you, they're sharing themselves. But you are the face of it. And so they're sending your content to, you know, their friends. Like, apparently I've read, I'm trying to remember where I heard this, but on Instagram, for instance, there's more activity in the DMs than there is even out in public. Okay. Because people are sharing stuff with their friends. I got all kinds of stuff I share with my friends through the DMs. I don't necessarily share publicly, not because it's bad or whatever, but it's just like, I know these guys are going to think this is funny. This is for them. Yeah. You know, but when people share your stuff, your stuff grows, right? And they're more likely to share it when they see themselves in you and you're able to say something that they wanted to say and weren't quite able to say or just hadn't been able to say that way. Mm -hmm. You know, and so it's like, that's that's by giving them meaning, by helping them articulate the way they feel about something, by simply articulating how I feel about something, then they take it and they share it. And so I guess that's a perfect example of how like when I lean into the meaning, like I could I could spend like a ton of money and I do sometimes, you know, and sometimes it's frustrating. Like I filmed this awesome music video. I spent a lot of money on it. It looks cool and people liked it. A lot of people liked it. But those things don't move the way when I say something that someone else wants to say for themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, when I lean into the meaning, it makes everything easier, right? It's like, it's free promotion. Right. I love that. You know, and so it's like it's it, it it's it's sharpening the axe and then spend five minutes chopping down the tree. Or I can not sharpen the axe. I can not articulate or figure out why it is I feel a certain way. And I can spend all day trying to chop the tree down with a dull axe. I just think that's like the artist's dilemma, though. You know what I mean? Like he's capturing, you know, uh, uh, you know, you hear the term magic in a bottle um, where something goes viral or or whatever. And you know, then you've got this sort of one hit wonder where people are like, oh man, they just got that one thing and they couldn't do it on repeat. I, I would just say something that's really interesting about you, right, is of course you've had songs that are bigger than others, but for, but if you really do listen, there is, um, there's something really meaningful just in your music alone that you've been able to do more than once. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And I, I wonder how that happens. And is it is that really the thing where you continue to re you go back to the well and revisit your why and you can do it again and again and again? Sometimes, yeah. I mean, it's um, in a lot of ways, it's like fishing. It's like the more time you spend on the water, the more likely you are to catch a fish. But some days you go out and you don't catch anything. Um, and it's like that with ideas or. Um, yeah, so some of it is um, just trying to make myself available to write a song or just writing a lot. You know, I write a lot of bad songs. And sometimes it's sitting around and asking myself all day, what are you doing? Why are you doing it? Why does it matter? And how does this make anyone else's life better? And sometimes it's just, and, and honestly, I, I think there's a, this is gonna sound a little weird, but sometimes there is a, a little bit of a good selfishness and maybe that's the wrong word, but, you know, like the reason I know that people need my songs is because I need 
these conversations that I'm mm. having in music. And I imagine there are at least a few more people out there in the world like me. Yeah. So it's like, there is this idea of writing the song with the door closed at first. And I think that's one reason I'm able to capture meaning is like, uh, what was the like old like uh, commercial from the 80s? I'm not, you know, the <laughs> I'm not just the hair club for men president. I'm also a client, you know, <laughs> yeah, like yeah, I yeah. need this music, like I need it. And so, but that's how I know that it should go is when I write something and I hear it, I'm like, I need to say this, I need to hear this, I need this. So certainly there's at least one other person out there who who also needs it, right? Mm. And you don't have to make as many, if you're making deep connections with people. So I got friends all, all over the industry and I have some friends who aren't super famous, but they do really well because they make deep connections with their audience. Mm -hmm. Right, and so they'll make a deep connection with their audience, and they'll play small shows. But those people will like spend lots of money on their books and on their merch, and you know, and they'll support them because they believe so deeply in what those artists are doing. Yeah, they're able to make deep connections. So you don't have to be as wide if you're able to go deep. Now, deep and wide is the is what you want. Yeah, for sure. You want a deep connection, and you want a wide connection. Yeah, but you don't have to have you don't have to have 2 million super fans to make it, right? You you just gotta have enough of those people, you know, that you ha make, have that deep connection with if you wanna make it. Obviously you wanna do better than make it. Yeah. But yeah. in music, a lot of people don't make it. It's really hard. Yeah. You know? Yeah, you've been- So making it it's time. kind of a big deal. Just making it is a big deal. It is a big deal. Yeah. And you know, uh, there's, um you know, tipping point, right? And I think a lot of entrepreneurs have something really similar because it, it is really hard to innovate, right? It's like you can tweak something, but it's hard to do something completely brand new. Plenty of songs have been written, plenty of genres, like some of the genre that you, you know, will play around is kind of like a folky singer songwriter thing. And then you'll go to rock and roll. And it's not like there haven't been rock and roll songs or folk sure. songs written before, right? But there's this thing that you were able to, to sort of tweak. And I think that that's at the center is this sort of the way people feel. And I think entrepreneurs have, uh, they're similar in that way to, uh, to artists because there's plenty of coffee shops out there, right? Why is yours different? You know what yeah. I mean? And there's these, there are these things that if you've got a pretty clear why, um, and that is really hard to discover. And that's why I love that you're saying you have to spend time in that mm -hmm. discovery and then re remembering it and revisiting it is really important. I think artists really, really struggle uh, at times uh, to monetize and to have sort of commercial success at the same time. And I think one of the things that would be good for you to talk about is, you know, you you, you do got to make a living, you have made it. And at the same time, how do you balance being an artist and being an entrepreneur? Yeah. How do you balance your time? Yeah. Um, so... As far as balancing the time, we in the music world, we we often work in seasons. You know, I have one season where I'm mostly just in the studio. And then I'll have a season where I'm paying a lot more attention to the business side. Now, you can't ignore either one ever. You yeah. ignore your business for too long and you're, it might walk away, mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> you know? Um, but there are seasons when I spend more time on it than others. Um, you know, and, and usually when I do an album, we do a new album. Things have changed so much. Like now I feel like people are just putting out music constantly. Yeah. I'm not quite to that point where I can do that. I feel like I, I still have, even if people don't realize, it, I still have album seasons. Even though I might release it over a longer period of time as singles, it's still like I have this chunk. There's this moment in time that is represented by this body of work. Yep. When I'm doing that, those years are usually incredibly busy. I'm gone a lot. I'm traveling a lot. You put it out. We're touring. Those are pretty big financial years, but you're also like, you're making money, but you're not necessarily spending spending the time to sit around and say, uh, and, and think through how you want to do it. Yeah. You know, then the year after be a little bit slower. Like, okay, how could we have done this better? How could we have done tour better? What worked? Um, Cause you know, with tour, you, you book all these shows, um, you know, maybe six to nine months out and you pick an opener and you pick a ticket price and you pick a marketing, you know, um, how you want to market the tour and um, when the 
singles to come out to make sure people are paying attention so they actually come yeah. to the show. And so you're doing all that. And then once it's go time, it's like, you're just in it, right? Yeah. So I also have a lot of help too. I have like a producer who's helped me produce the music. Um, and I have a manager who helps with some of the business stuff as well. And so every now and then me and my manager will sit down and we'll just list all the ways that we could possibly make money. Mm. And we'll say, all right, are we doing better or worse in this area than that area? Does this area even exist anymore? Like I still have a, I still have a, like a warehouse full of CDs, <laughs> you know, it's like, and people, a very small percentage of people still do buy CDs. Wow. We still sell a few, not a significant amount, mm -hmm. you know, um, but we do have some people, but generally that's basically gone. Yeah. That's over, you know? So we're like, and what are we not doing? So number one, we'll sit down and look at all the ways we're talking about the business, um, ways we're doing well, ways we can grow. And there's probably like 16 or 17 different um, ways that we monetize. I mean, I, I wrote it down no, because tell, you gotta I'm going to read them off. I'm going to read them off because I, I don't even know if I can recite them all. We have publishing, performing rights, um, licensing, micro licensing, multi tracks, which is like micro licensing, except people can license the, all, you know, the stems. Okay. So if you're if they want to play your song like at church or karaoke, they could if they have a guitar player, they can turn the guitar off and they can play a guitar. Yeah, you know? so there we, you go. Um, digital streaming platforms, you know, there's obviously the big ones which are Apple Music and um, Spotify, but that also includes YouTube. And there's a bunch of different ones in different territories, um, different ones in Europe and in South America and whatnot. Um, the DSPs, digital streaming platforms, and then there's tour and tour breaks down into ticket sales. We do a pre-show add-on where if people want a little bit deeper experience, they can show up and listen to me talk and they can ask questions. And, you know, so we have the pre-show add-on, which is significant because sometimes the ticket sales is really just paying my band and paying the fees and yeah. paying all that kind of stuff. And that pre-show sometimes is like, that's for <laughs> That's yours. That's mine. Yeah. yeah. But then we, uh, you know, we sell merch live, um, live merch, sponsorships, all that's part of tour. Um, appearances, internet sales, collaborations, music production. I don't do so much with music production, but I have in the past where other artists like how I sound, and so I'll produce songs for them. Yeah. There's all sorts of other things. But we have all this kind of stuff going on, so we go through the list, and we're like, there's, you know, there's like three of us. So we sit down and be like, what can we do better? You know, what is worth, what, what, what's even relevant anymore? Yeah. And what are we not even thinking of? Yeah. Right. And then we try and figure out how all that works with what we're already doing. Because what we're doing is creating meaning, creating connection, and then uh, building community. That's actually what we're doing. And that's really the platform that all the business flows out of, right? That's like the well that the business flows out of. So if that's healthy, then we can start asking questions about how to do all this, you know? Can you say that again? Because I love the three things that you just said. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the what, three things that you're what doing. What we are doing is we are um, making meaning, we are making connections, and then we are cultivating community. That's what we're doing. Right? And there, there's commonality right yeah. there with any entrepreneur. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Because and, and one of the things you've done really well in the, in the community side of it, right? We talked about the, the, the meaning there's the connections that we can talk about, but ultimately on the uh, on the creating community, you've done a really good job on social media, right? There's, you know, um, there's a I, I'd say you've you've done something pretty meaningful, not just the size of the audience, but the engagement, mm -hmm. right? And I just wonder what's sort of the in your mind, what is the role of social media yeah. for you? Social media is um, one way that we connect, and it's one way we try and foster community. So obviously, um, if, if I'm saying things that resonate with people, they'll share it. Yep. And that's sort of the awareness portion. I didn't previously exist in their world, and now I do, mm -hmm. right? And so maybe they're paying attention. So, um, but also it's for, um, there are people who um, are already sort of connected, and how do I maintain that relationship, you know? Yeah. So social media, in a lot of ways, is how I maintain that relationship. Um, it's also how like, um, no, like I, this, this is almost a joke, uh, because it happens so often, but it, this is so common. 
I'll play a show in Chicago, right? And then the next day, literally the next day, in the DM, someone's like, man, how come you never come to Chicago? <laughs> you know? And I'm like, I literally was just there. You're like, we missed each other. I know, exactly. So you got to maintain that connection. So there are people, so this person, and it happens so often. Yeah. This person, obviously, he or she, they like what I do enough that they're obviously paying attention. And they're obviously enough to just go to the DMs and be kind of a jerk, but I appreciate it to be like, how come you never come to my city? Yeah. I mean, that's what you want. You want people who are like, mm -hmm. can you please come and do your thing for me? Can you please let me buy a ticket to see your show? Can yeah. you please let me buy your stuff? And you're like, but I was in your city. So, you know, so social media is really about um, making connections and maintaining connections. And and really too, uh, it's a great place depending on the platform where people get to talk to one another. Yeah. You know, even in the comments and stuff. Yeah. And, um, and that's really the the community, the, the, the key to community is commonality, right? Mm -hmm. The word community comes from the words common and unity, right? So you're looking for a common place. So you foster community by creating common things where people can share things in common, right? Yeah. Or they can argue about things. Yeah, for yeah. sure. <laughs> and I mean, I guess, yeah. Well, one of the things that you you do as well is like, so if social media is a place for, you know, you can have kind of a one-to-one -one connection in the DMs. Yeah. You've got a really, you know, one-to-many uh, relationship uh, that can, that happens with just you, you know, posting and people sharing. And then you've got sort of this peer-to-peer -peer, uh, aspect as well. And that's sort of the collection of community. And sales-wise right? You, you're, it's really hard to get off, you know, Instagram's made it yeah. easier, right? And some yeah, social yeah. media platforms have made it easier, some not so much. Yeah. And there are these things that happen in live events and it isn't always that people are going to go follow you on social media and learn everything. And so, right. Yep. So what are some of the other ways that you sort of maintain uh, the community and have kind of like connection? Is it email so, lists, cell phone numbers? Yep. So it's always changing and I'm always considering new things. And I try and keep up with most of the platforms. Um, one will usually be the one that works the best. And so I'll put 80% of my social media time on that one and 20% on the others in case things move and change. Cause they have, I started on MySpace. you know, I remember getting up every morning, you know, before I went to work and I would friend 50 people, <laughs> I would find people who were following a band that I thought was similar to me. And I go and I just friend them. You know, and so over time, I've rolled all that into, you know, I, 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 I think I started on Instagram in 2011. Yeah, maybe that may be happening um, on TikTok soon. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, I, I still think um, from my point of view, um, the, the best connection you can have with somebody um, is an email. Mm. You know, email is still the best. So one of my goals, as far as like maintaining connection, one of my biggest goals is to get, is to move people to email. Because also if one of the big platforms, you know, happens to be owned by a foreign entity and the government shuts them down. Yeah. What are you gonna do if you don't have an email list? Mm -hmm. And also there are platforms that worked really well for me that stopped. What do you do when that happens? You know, so one, it's just great to own your stuff to know that like you own this connection. And also I use the platforms. I'm really not against any of the platforms, but those don't belong. And that part of the, one of the hard things is that we pour a lot of time and money and energy into those, but they don't really belong to us. Mm -hmm. They can change the algorithm at any moment and it doesn't work anymore. Yep. And that's fine. I guess that's, you know, it's the their the prerogative, game. but it doesn't affect me as long as I am moving those people over to my email list. Yeah. So one thing I want to do is make the email list itself more meaningful. Have things that people look forward to seeing when they open the emails. Yeah, you know? yeah. Um, the other thing is email doesn't work on an algorithm. You know, I know it's a like, transaction. It is. It's like boom, and I, I like to send them early in the morning because I feel like most people first thing they do is they get to work and they look at their email. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, different people have different strategies as far as when to send an email. Um, but yeah, that's, from my perspective, the email is um, probably the, the strongest connection yeah. I can have with a large group of people. You know, um, if I can physically be in front of those people, and this is one thing I tell young artists, 
when they ask, um, when they like, they want to know what they can do, what they need to be doing. Um, how can they make it? Like, I think one of the best things you can do as an artist right now is to get in front of live human beings any way that you can. Mm. Because so many people, I mean, you have to do the social media thing, but so many people are fighting for that space and they count on going viral to make their career. And But you might never go viral. Yeah. But if you can get in front of human beings. The other thing is, if you're real smart, you know, like I see Gary Vee in front of human beings and going viral. Oh, yeah. And so I like, like young artists, go play. Get in front of people. I don't care if it's five people. I had a friend one time, he wanted to know what he needed to do. And I was like, you need to do 100 house shows. 100 house shows. And he did it. And he kind of built a little career off of it. He did pretty good. He, he ended up doing some other stuff. He went into acting or whatever. But, um, but, but he did 100 house shows. He might be in front of five people um, in a city. But if, if you do 100 shows, that's 100 cities where you have five people. And if you're good... They're sharing you. And they're not just sharing you. They're sharing you from all over the country. Mm -hmm. They're not just sharing you from this one city, or this one place. Yeah. You know? And that's what that's kind of what uh, my wife and I did early on. We used to sold CDs out of the trunk of our car, literally out of the trunk of our car. And we, we traveled. And we did these little things all over the country. Yeah. And we made these little connections. And we made these little relationships. And a lot of those relationships were like actual relationships with like actual human beings that we met. And we kept up with a lot of those people. Yeah. But those people became our biggest advocates, even to this day. You know, the people we met early on yeah. who were there when there was only 10 people, but they loved it. And the, and I know their name. They know my name. Some of them have my text. Some of, you know, I got friends that I just met who were just fans from back in the day. And, you know, we keep up. But see, Amazing. they're the people who are like always sharing your stuff. They're mm -hmm. always supporting you. Yeah, they're champions. And if you have, you have, you know, a handful of champions in every major market in the United States, like that's an asset. Like that's a legit asset that you can build off of. Yeah. Instead of sitting around just trying to go viral. I mean, you know, it's helpful to go viral. Yeah, it's like if, if you're hoping for a grand slam, yeah. you know, a couple of base yeah. hits probably help. You know, one of the things that you're talking about, you know, this connected world. And um, I think one of the things that, I have really thought about with just even, you know, this podcast is um, just how lonely, even in a connected world, it can uh, seem or feel mm -hmm. um, being any type of entrepreneur or an artist. And I think that that's something that you've got, I'd say some experience with just from, uh, you know, you know, us being friends. And I think it'd be good for you to kind of talk about how you've dealt with seasons where you were like, man, it feels pretty lonely. Yeah, yeah. Ah, you know, it's really hard. I think too, so there's something, you know, people can, uh, and I don't blame them. I'll, I'll laugh at them too if they make fun of me for saying this, you know. But there is something to like, your closest friends, you can share your biggest victories and you can share your defeats, right? But it is difficult sometimes. Like you want to celebrate your wins and celebrate your defeats. And when you've been successful, sometimes it's hard to celebrate your wins because other people aren't as successful and makes them feel... Uh, or maybe you just, maybe I'm just self-conscious and feel like they, um, it, it sounds like I'm bragging. When really I'm just, I want to celebrate. I worked real yeah. hard and yeah, it yeah. turned out great and I'm excited about it. And then when something doesn't work out for you, you know, I have so many friends who work really hard and really good at what they do who haven't been as successful as me for whatever reason, you know, and they're like, I don't want to hear you crying that your show didn't go very well, you know, mm -hmm. because you're, at least you're playing a show, yeah. you know? So I don't like, know. Maybe, so maybe all that, little. maybe this is mean just like, maybe this is, you know, this is like my, um, yeah, but that's real stuff. There's like privileged problems, right? Privileged problems. But, um, but for real though, a lot of times you're out there just doing the work on your own. Yep. And maybe that's more what we're talking about. You're doing the work on your own and you're like, for me, I, uh, I mean, this is real for me. I've had this conversation with my wife recently. Like I built a cool studio in my basement. It's, like looks cool. I like it. It's the place, you know, it looks like a place I want to be. And I, for the most part, enjoy working there. But I was telling my wife, I was like, I am really tired of sitting in my cool room by myself. You know, I'm really tired of looking at like my comic book wall with all my cool instruments and like not having anybody else to pick one up. Yeah. And, you know, and during the pandemic, we started, because um, technology had, you know, 
20 years ago, 15 years ago, the technology wasn't, it wasn't so easy for everyone to just record their part and just Yeah, you send really it to had you. to go somewhere. But right around the time of the pandemic, technology had become like really good at doing that, right? And, and most of my friends already had gear at their house. And could, so we got to where like, we're doing a lot of work remote, which sounds really fun. And in, in one sense, it's really cool. There's like a saxophone player like in Oregon who can do, who can, who can, play a part and send it to me. There's an organ player in LA and a drummer in New York. Like I can use all those people. And it, that is so fascinating. Or even people who like, you wouldn't have access to before. People who play with like the top of the top, you know, if they're not doing anything, sometimes you can like hit them up and be like, how much for two hours to play a solo on the song? And a lot of times they'll just be like, yeah, all right. And they'll do it. That that would be would have been out of reach yeah. previously. That would have been impossible. Yeah, you previously. gotta fly him somewhere. Or... Exactly. Um, now you can do that. But the downside is I'm sitting at home staring at a computer screen all day. Yeah. And I I never I got into music and songwriting and all this stuff really because I love the connection. I love singing. That's when I realized I want to do this for a living. Is the first time I walked out on a stage and heard people singing my words back to me. It was like at a big conference, right? Mm -hmm. And I walked out and I sang my song and they heard the chorus. And the second time the chorus came around, the entire crowd was singing. This song, I hadn't recorded it before. Yeah. I didn't know it was a thing I could do. And that was it for me. I was like, this feeling, I, I want to always have access to this feeling, mm -hmm. to be able to walk out and do that. And then the other thing that I love is when you've done something really, really hard. And I say this, I don't want anyone to feel sorry for me because I don't feel sorry for myself, but it's really, really hard to travel city to city, to set up, spend all day setting up, to um, come up with a performance or a show or whatever you want to call it that's going to be really meaningful and really good and then get people to actually come out it's really hard to do. And then for them to come out and give them more than they paid for and to know that they're loving every minute of it, that's hard to do. And I can do that with a team, right? And we go do that and it feels so good to work so hard. Yeah. And to feel that feeling and you get on the bus and you crack a beer and everyone looks around and you're like, did we do that? I think we did that. I think we did. I love it. Yeah. Those are the two things I love the most. Yeah. Because when I talk about meaning, I mean it. But when you see yeah. the people's faces and hear their voices, like that meaning that you made is no longer a guess whether or not it matters to yeah. them. It's live feedback. You're feeling it. You're getting live feedback right there. If it, That feeling is priceless. Yeah. There's no other feeling like that. And the further distance you have from those experiences exactly. to sitting in your basement, it yeah. e eats at you a little bit. Yeah, and I'm like... And it goes back to the why. I'm like, why am I doing this? Yeah. I can make more money this way. But is this really feeding me? And is it feeding me in a way that's long-term going to be sustainable? Mm -hmm. And no one wants to be that artist who doesn't like their own music anymore. Yeah. Right? Or that artist who resents their audience. That's the worst. That's the worst when, they, when they, they've got to the point where they don't know that they like it anymore. And so it's like... I feel like I've got to love it. And yeah, so it does get lonely sometimes. Yeah. I, I was even telling my um my manager recently, I was like, I was like, I don't care if we make any money this fall. I mean, I'd like to. It'd be nice. But I miss playing with my band. I just want to book any kind of tour anywhere so that we can just go play. We can just get in front of people and play. Yeah. You know. Um, cause it's been about a year yeah. I've been, it, it, and for a number of reasons, that's a whole different conversation, but it's been about a year since I've been out on the road with my band. I yeah. mean, I kind of, I miss it. You're feeling yeah. it. So this is a really, this is a big deal to me. Yeah. The loneliness, it's, it, it gets tough. I feel like, I feel like, um, this is a big thing for everybody now though. Yeah. Technology has given us a lot of access to each other, but it's also made us lonely because we're not engaging in the you know, in that face-to-face -face kind of world. It also that we're able designed to, to do. Exactly. And the, the vulnerability that endears people to one another is not necessarily possible all the time in a text or, you know, in a Zoom call or, or whatever. I mean, I appreciate that stuff. Like, you know, right now I'm I'm a long way from my family and it's nice to send a text to my kids and be like, love you, miss you. It's yeah. great. 
there are massive advantages yeah. and yeah. done, you know, maybe too much, it can be a disadvantage yeah. as well. Yeah. But loneliness is also really unhealthy. I have a friend of mine who says that loneliness is worse for you than cigarettes. As wow. far as like, you know, people don't live very long when they're lonely, you know? So that's something I want to fix. And, and that's why it's a big conversation, I think, um, for me right now is, um, I, that's one of the big things I said earlier this year. I was like, one of my goals is to get in the room with other humans that I know and care about, you know, as, as often as I can this year. Yeah. You know, cause you have to make an effort, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and that the thing is, is, um, you know, you've got this, uh, uh, desire to get to like, it's almost like this thing's building up and you're like, I got to get it out. I got to be able to give it yeah. that. And, and the feedback is important as well. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the things that's interesting about the industry that you're in, uh, is how much it's changed. Yeah. And how the, the adaptations you've had to make in order to make money. And so I just wonder like, what did you think the music industry was gonna be yeah, and yeah. what is it now yep it's changed so much and it continues to change you know like in the in the 80s and 90s a lot of the big bands would do one album every three years and i thought you spend a whole year making an album and then you spend you know months marketing it and you spend like a year and a half touring it and then you take a break and you write the next album. I thought that's what it was going to be. Right. Um, but that's changed significantly. Mm -hmm. Um, and the biggest change there's two, I think it's one, one thing, um, there's, uh, technology has changed music for better and worse, which technology is interesting. How it does it, it does good and bad things at the same time, mm -hmm. you know, all, almost all the time. So one of the good things is like when I first started making music, it was very expensive to make a good album. It was very expensive um, because the technology wasn't there, right? You had to rent a big studio and you had to pay, uh, when you rent a big studio, you got to pay at least a couple of people just to run the basic things. And you have the producer there and you have the band there. And then um, if somebody messes up, you got to just record the whole song again. You know, now someone messes up, you know, they play the whole thing. It's almost perfect. One mess up. It's just literally, we're going to go in digitally and tweak it, you know, but even like, I was a little bit flat on that, you know, like, I don't know, I'm just going to kick it up a little bit, you know? Yeah. And, and so like, um, and so technology has made music way easier to make now. You can, for not a whole lot of money, you can make a professional quality album, right? Um, you, you know, obviously more money means you have more access to uh, different musicians, you have more time, you have, you know, you can get better tones and stuff. But now like, it's really inexpensive to make albums compared to the way it used to be. Mm -hmm. um, but the problem is the same technology has made it really easy for people not to pay you for those albums, right? That's true. So it's like, there are more people, and I, I think it's a good thing that there are more people who can engage in the music making, the ritual of recording music, you know? Um, as you used to have to have a whole lot of money you didn't have to have a lot of money to write songs or play songs, but you had to have a lot of money to make a good recording. Yeah, something that people wanted to listen yeah. to. Yeah, and uh, so that's actually good because there's a lot more people out there who are able to participate. But the downside is that there's a lot, it's a lot more difficult to figure out how to pay for those albums, to pay those musicians. And in a lot of ways, it's really the, it's the musicians who suffer the most, mm. you know? Because as a writer, you own intellectual property. And so you can, over time, you can you have an asset, you can make money off of it, yeah. publishing and that kind of thing. Um, but when there's less money overall, there's less money to pay the individual musicians. And then you're like, well, we could have him in for two days, but I also could just tweak this and we don't have to. Or I could sample the drums and we could, there's all kinds of things yeah. like that, you know? And so it's both positive and negative. And then you know, you kind of have the move from CDs to downloads, right? Mm -hmm. um, which that was really, looking back, was probably prime time for being an independent musician. Because previously, you could make a lot of money selling CDs, but you also had to print the CDs, you had to ship the CDs, you had to sell them. And CDs were sold on consignment, like magazines, right? Mm -hmm. So if you wanted to have 10 of your CDs 
on the shelf in every record store in America. It's going to cost you millions of dollars to be there, mm -hmm. just to show up, just in stock. And so um, when downloads came along, it's like you didn't have to do that, right? It's like I can be on the front page of iTunes and not be on a record company. I don't need a million dollars to be to have access to millions of people. Mm -hmm. And that was great, but as that technology progressed, you know, it's also the same thing that allowed us to participate also was the same thing that sort of makes it harder to make a living off of the music. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Cuz I mean, there's download, you know, it's the streaming share, right? And you know, there, it's it's how much in the pool that you can make, and it's the bigger artists that get the bigger share of the pie. It's true. Yeah, it's very true. Well, I mean, that's uh, really well well articulated. That right there is, um, you know, just even talking about that, the level of uh, situational awareness to adapt, right, and to figure out how to keep carry on and carry this sort of how I got to be what we started the conversation with, I got to really be close to my why and I got to make sure it's front and center and that I haven't deviated too much. And then there's the pressures of life where you're like, man, I, I, I need to, you know, not only provide, but I want to give my, my family or my friends the best. And, you know, you got to take care of your band and your people or your employees, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And one of the things that I, I want to make sure that we have time for you to really talk about is all of that, uh, you know, all of those wins, the fails, the adaptations, um, the struggles, there is this sort of um, really, I'm going to say a common thread that I think is a really important one. And there's, there's your physical health, right? Because you got to be able to carry on and do mm -hmm. these things. But mental health is one of the things that I think has uh, can pay some of the biggest tax or to, it can take yeah. the biggest toll, right. With all of those different things that you're, that, that you've had to face with all of the industry changes and all these things. So what, what is kind of like, how do you, how do you sort of get yourself into a place of mental health? And how do you know you're deviating? Mm -hmm. I think for me, a lot of it is like super basic stuff, like exercise, sleep, it's like the super boring things. Like when I'm not feeling right, when something feels off, um, I've got a checklist that I go through, mm -hmm. right? Usually when something is off, when you're feeling anxiety, when you're, um, when you're feeling uh, depressed, normally, I mean, you know, it can be a physical thing. It can be a chemical thing. But a lot of times it's that, um, well, even the chemical thing relates. A lot of times there's a need that's not being met, right? Like, and when I was, the thing is, when it, when I was young, you know, you recover so much faster yeah. than you do when you're older, right? Like I remember uh, recently going to, uh, I didn't have my wisdom teeth taken out when I was young and um, I was having a little bit of a problem. And so I went to see a, a dental surgeon uh, and um, an oral surgeon and he sat me down and said, okay, I just wanna make sure you wanna do this. <laughs> and he got on a whiteboard and he said, if, uh, if you're 18, because your body is still growing, you heal so fast. And he's like, so he takes the thing, he's like, this is you. And he's, when you're 18, and he draws this line, it's like up and down, it's just like a hump, boom, right? He's like, you'll be better in a weekend, right? Mm -hmm. you'll, you'll be back at work on Monday, you'll be fine. He's like, but because you're not still growing anymore, you're in your 40s, he's like, this is you. And he just draws it and the line goes so long. It could take, <laughs> he's like, it could take you, you know, two to three weeks to recover, right? And so there was a point when I had to realize like, I am living like I, you know, I was almost 40 and I was living like I was 25. Mm -hmm. I was 25, I didn't have to sleep. Cause we travel in music. We always joke that we're professional travelers who get to play music occasionally, right? <laughs> There's the travel. True. And the, the two areas that you are mostly taxed when you're traveling, um, it's, it's sleep and food because, you know, food is, you know, on the road, right? And sleep Take is you, you, you only sleep, you sleep when you can. You try to sleep on the plane, you sleep on the bus. And then you, if you're on a big tour and you're making a lot of money, you know, the, the bus is not so bad. But if you're driving city to city, like when I was 25, we were, sometimes we would do, we'd get up at the hotel, you know, um, and we would drive eight hours 
right? We would spend two hours loading in, spend two hours sound checking. I would do like a a VIP thing where I'm people come early and then the opener would go on and I'd have a minute and then we would go on and we play a two hour show and they spend an hour and a half tearing down and I'd like go out to the merch table and meet people. Then we get to the hotel, you know, at that point it's like one in the morning, right? Two in the morning, you get the hotel and then you gotta, you get up and do it again. And we relished it when we were young, but you know, there was, there was a point where I was like, I was like, why is my life falling apart? You know? Yeah. And uh, and I realized someone had to sit me down and tell me, you realize like, just cause you want to do it and you're willing to suffer for it does not mean that your body is capable of doing what everything that you want to do. Mm -hmm. And you're gonna have to figure out how to minimize and maximize, right? The things that are hard on you, on your body, you're gonna have to learn how to minimize and the things that you can do that don't require as much of you physically, you're gonna have to maximize. And if you really want to do this well, long-term, you're gonna have to get in good health. Mm -hmm. And, um, but it's amazing to me how that the positive impact just basic health has on my, on my brain. Mm -hmm on my mental health, you know? And then there are other things too, but I started to look at my body as a machine. My body in my mind is a machine that needs maintenance. And when something is off, you know, it's like, it's low on oil or I need washer fluid or, mm -hmm. you know, or I'm out of gas, you know? Um, so this is probably my main thing. That, and I just have, I have good people in my life that I talk to. I yeah. have people who don't care about my career, who are not impressed with anything I've done. And they're also not disappointed in me with any of the areas that I feel like I failed. Yeah. They're just people, you know, who I can, you know, we can sit around the fire and we can talk and they're going to tell me what's up, even if it hurts my feelings. Yeah. Right. You know, so that's a big part of it too, is cultivating those relationships. And also I'm um, definitely, I definitely think therapy is awesome. I have a friend who says either you're, <laughs> You're either in therapy or you're on your way. <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, it's just like you're you're a machine. You yeah. got to maintain your machine. Yeah. You know, and a well-maintained machine. I'm trying to remember who told me one time, it's way easier to change the oil than to put a new engine in your car. Yeah. You know, so I'm always asking myself. And honestly, my work is so much more meaningful when I am taking care of myself. Yeah, that's good. Because my mind is there. And I can see, I'm like, yeah, this is good. I was like, I know this is good. I get more done and it, it's, you know, and, and it feels, it's one of those things, right? I'm going to spend all day sharpening the ax. So it only takes me five minutes to chop the tree down. Right? Or if I don't sharpen the ax, but don't take care of myself, it's going to take me all day to chop that tree down. Well said, dude. Yeah. Well, we've talked about a lot of stuff. Um, I think it'd be really helpful if you kind of gave, you know, a piece of advice Sure. You know, to aspiring musicians or entrepreneurs who's kind of like, you know, trying to make their way through this, any hyper competitive industry, what, yep. what advice would you give? I think that if you learn how to love the process, learn how to love the process, like fall in love with doing the work in a good way, not in the ego way, but in a way like learn to enjoy the work. Don't just look at the outcomes. Number one, because you spend most of your life doing the work and it's only a small percentage of your life where you get to celebrate the outcome, right? And you obviously, you want the outcome, but if you love what you do, you will do, I, my theory is if you love what you do, you will naturally do a better job at it uh, without having to think about it, right? You just naturally do better because you love it. And if you do better, you're going to have, if you want to call it a product, you're going to have a better product and people are going to like it more and they're going to buy it more. Right. And then at the end of the day, if you don't have the big outcome that you want, you still did something you loved and that in itself is a win. Mm -hmm. Right. But if you can learn to fall in love with the process and for mus musicians, especially, this is incredibly important because if you're going to be an artist, you're going to spend a long time not making money. Right, you're gonna spend a long time creating those connections and building that audience. And if you try and if you try and tap that audience too soon, you're gonna run them off. Let me like, I mean, I like your song, but I'm not gonna spend twenty dollars a month on your Patreon. I'm not gonna 
uh, man, I like your song, but I'm not going to travel two hours and go see you play in another town because I like your song. It takes time to build those, to build trust and build those connections with people. And uh, you kind of need to look at it as uh, um, as those relationships are really your biggest asset, right? But if you don't love the process, it's going to be a really, really frustrating journey for you as a musician, as an artist, I think. But I think in any field, if you love what you do and it's meaningful to you, you're going to do it better. You know, like I, I have a friend who talks about, um, he likes to look at a thing and call it an idea. He look at <laughs> look at a restaurant and be like, well, that, that's an idea, right? Yeah. And you walk in, it's an idea. You're like, you're right. Some very smart person realized there's a need for this. And so they put this here, but they're not actually passionate about that thing. And you've all been to those places, right? Where you walk in and you're like, this is getting the job done, but no one here cares about it, right? There are movies that have come out recently that I knew were going to flop. And it's not because I know much about movies. I'm like, I'm not going to say what the movie is, but I knew it was going to flop. And I knew because I'm like, you cannot convince me that the director cares about these characters. Yeah. You can't. Don't tell me that any of the actors knew they existed, right? Yep. Or that they read this script and liked it. No one involved on any level is passionate about this group of characters or about this story. And you could tell from the beginning, right? And and, and the movie flopped, right? Because nobody really cares, mm. you know? And then there's certainly there are blockbusters that no one cares about and they do them well and they're entertaining, you know? So I'm not saying that it's a, it's a rule. And there are all kinds of businesses where people just meet a need and the owner doesn't love the business and they just, they do a good job and they make it. But you know, when you walk in a coffee shop and you're like, somebody designed these walls, somebody loved this place. And I love being here because somebody else loved it. That's not an idea. That's, that's someone put some meaning into, into that business. Yeah. You know, there's a huge business downtown I don't know. I don't like putting other people's things down, but there's, there's a business downtown. Um, was is a movie theater chain that I think should have really worked. They're serving food and then the whole high end thing. And I think someone thought, man, this city really needs this type of thing. And they did it and it just, it failed. And I don't know that it failed because it wasn't good. You just saw it. It, it only lasted a few years and each year the quality went down. You can see they weren't investing more time and energy yeah. into it. Went down and then they ended up closing the doors. But I've been to that same type of thing in other cities where you can tell people obviously love this. Mm -hmm. Somebody is really passionate or finds meaning in doing this for people. The mm -hmm. food is good. The experience is good, right? So one thing is an idea. Like, well, that's an idea. But the other thing is something else. Man, that, the thing that strikes me when you're talking like that is there's a difference between selling something and offering something. And yeah you know, uh, the meaning you're, you're able to offer something, right. Versus a transit, you're looking for a transaction and both of them can involve money. Yeah. That's the word transaction. Yeah. You know, and it's okay. There are a lot of businesses that are just transactions. There's nothing morally wrong with that. Yeah. I just feel like if you're going to spend your life doing something, don't just make a transaction. Right. But it's not even like, I'm not even saying you need to leave what you do and do something else. I've got a really good friend. Uh, he played on every major country album in the 90s. He, uh, he played with Elton John and Sting. Um, the pro There's producers who used to call him in. They were working with big bands. I'm not going to say what bands, but you would know if I said their name. Huge bands. They would leave, and the producer would call him in at night and fix all their parts. And he'd fix them so well that the band didn't know that he had fixed them. Right? Wow. You know, so he's been in the music industry forever. And he said, there's a difference in a player and a professional. A player can play the part, but a professional shows up every day and figures out how to fall in love with the song that they've played every day for the last six months. And he regularly was a band leader for really huge artists. And, the, um, and so and he was constantly trying to keep the band motivated in that space. So whatever it is you're doing, you can figure out how to find meaning in it. I'm pretty, I'm pretty convinced. But to, so in a lot of ways, it's an approach. Mm -hmm. Offering something versus just a transaction. Yeah. Yeah. Well said, dude. Well, what's, uh, what's next for John Mark McMillan? What is next? Um, I'm always working on new music. 
I've got a I got a handful of singles. I've done some cool collaborations that I'm I'm pretty excited about excited about. And I'm working on a whole new album. And I've been most people who know me probably know my songs from like the worship music space. And I've done a lot of other things, but my biggest songs have definitely been in that space. And I kinda I kind of veered out of it for a little bit and moved more towards an adjacent type of um space. But last year was honestly a very difficult year for a number of reasons. My wife had health issues. My dad had a stroke. Her dad was very sick and ended up passing away. So it was, it was a difficult year, but I found myself around the house, like sing, <laughs> singing these like old school worship choruses. Mm. You know, I wasn't planning on recording any of those. I was actively working on other music. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and at a point I was like, these like little worship choruses are like pleasantly haunting my life. I was like, maybe they need a place to live. Maybe they need a home. So I kind of, I didn't think I would do this. Um, I didn't rule it out, but I really never thought I was going to lean back into like worship music. Mm -hmm. But these little haunting, pleasantly haunting songs were just hanging around us. And I started to feel like they needed a home. So I'm recording kind of a worship album wow. that I'm, I'm real excited about. It's, I'm a little nervous because it's, it's, you know, it is leaning back into an area that I haven't been a part of in a while. Mm -hmm. And um, and uh, I think people are gonna like it though. That's awesome. I think people will like it. A lot of people who followed me for a long time get that that's part of what I do. Yeah. And um, it's so uncool that it's cool. Uh, something about it is refreshing. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure it's gonna be good. Uh, yeah. But so I'm doing that. Um, I've got some other big ideas. We'll see if they're just ideas oh, or man. if there's something else. Here we go. Yeah. Well, um, I just got to say, uh, I have really enjoyed having you sit in this seat. I've wanted to have this conversation with you for a long time. You know, I've got a tremendous amount of respect for you as an artist, as a person, mm -hmm. as a man. And uh, I just appreciate you coming all this way to sit down and talk with us. Man, well, it's an honor. Seriously. Absolutely. Now for some rapid fire questions rapid with John fire. Mark McMillan. You ready? It's like somebody knew you when they put these together. <laughs> uh oh, <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I don't know. And it wasn't me. I'm just, just for for the record, favorite Bob Dylan song. Oh, my favorite Bob Dylan song. Ah, uh, when the deal goes down. Okay, what is your favorite city to perform in? Oh, this is controversial. It is because I want every city <laughs> to think that it's them. And the truth is. There's only a couple of cities that I don't like. I'm not going to say what those cities For are. For sure. But my favorite city to play in might be Chicago. There's just something about sh Chicago people and the way they show up. Nice. Yeah, but Atlanta would be a close second. The, yeah, it's hard. hard. It's tough. Yeah, well, you know, I appreciate you not just picking one. Yeah. Um, you can choose i'm gonna i'm gonna say this but just kind of pick one here is it prince or michael jackson prince johnny cash or willie nelson johnny cash but Dang. that's hard i know I, beyonce or taylor swift beyonce oh man all right what is one app that you can't live without on tour i mean this is so whatever but google maps <laughs> mostly though i know because it yeah, most people can't live their lives without Google Maps. But on tour, I remember back in the day when you, um, you know, I kept a roll of quarters and we stopped at the payphone to call and check in. And we used to print like maps in every hotel. If one ho if, if the hotel had a bad computer and you couldn't print your maps out, you were like in big trouble. Yeah. And so it's really nice to know where you're going. But also it's really nice to know where to get a coffee. Mm -hmm. Back in the day, you didn't know. You just had to eat at a chain restaurant. And you had to guess. And you had to guess. Mm -hmm. So Google Maps. All right, this one's going to be hard. Favorite Marvel character? Wolverine. I knew it. Wolverine. All right, if you could wake up tomorrow and have one superpower, just one, what would it be? Hmm. I like to be invincible. I like to be invincible. And that's a real heavy answer, but there are bad things happening in the world. It'd be great to just go to those places and just like shut people down. <laughs> it's like, you can't kill me. You can't kill me. I'm going to stop this. I stuff I going. don't like, I'm going to stop it. Man. 
that would be great. I love that. Yeah. That is, I mean, Invincibility. That's, that's the superhero in you. Yeah. All right. Uh, you got three words. Describe your morning routine. Mm. On tour. On tour. Slow. Quiet. And bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. That's one thing about tour is uh no matter how nice your bus is, like, you know, you you gotta find a nice you, bathroom. Yeah. Yeah. I mean it's a thing. Yeah, I know. Yeah. All right. What what is the last <laughs> business book you read? The last business book. This is gonna be controversial because it's not a business book. Okay. But it's called Story by Robert McKee. And it's actually about screenwriting. But story is so deep in human beings i learned so much about people from that screenwriting book i don't i don't plan on ever writing a screenplay yeah but it's the the depth to which story is in us as human beings almost to the point where you could say that a person is really a story with a body and in business i think that's understanding that is a big deal in business. And the better you understand how to tell a story, the the better you're going to be at whatever it is that you're doing. Love it. Calling or texting? Mm. Calling. What is one hidden fat? What is one hidden talent that your fans would be surprised to know that you had? Mm. One hidden talent. One hidden talent. I don't know that I have. I don't know that I have a lot of talent. You're like, well, I sort of put it on display. Mm. That's my that's my hidden talent. Is there an instrument that you play that nobody uh, knows? I don't know. I'm drawing a blank. A blank. I feel like there should be something, something remarkable, something remarkable, something fun and exciting and interesting to say. Hidden you're, talent. You're like I can cook. I'm terrible at cooking. <laughs> My wife is so good, though. It's sort of like I tried it, and it's so bad. There's she no said, room for sucked. me to grow. There's no room for me to grow because I can't even get up to average for her. Oh, my gosh. So I'm really good at figuring out how to get airline miles out of every situation. Dude, I love that you had you had to go back to get that. That's really good. <laughs> That's the kind of stuff I care about. I'm so nerdy about air, uh, air miles. I'm like, let's get more miles. You know, I'm gonna take that second leg to get another PQP. Exactly. Um, well, all I have to say is it was awesome to have you out here to have this conversation, to hear the things expressed the way that you look at the world. And uh, I'm just I'm just excited to have you. Well, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. It was Until seriously an honor and so much fun.